We are to review the actions of the Imperial Japanese Army's 109th Division at Iwo Jima, but Imperial Japanese naval personnel and other attached units will be glossed over or intentionally left out. This is not an overall view of the Battle of Iwo Jima, but solely about this specific division. A regular IJA division is about 20,000 men. It consists of three infantry regiments, one cavalry regiment, one artillery regiment, one engineering battalion, one army service corps, commanded by a lieutenant general. Sometimes they substitute out the cavalry regiment and put in artillery. The 109th Division was reformed in May 1944 from the 1st Independent Mixed Brigade and other Bonin Island garrisons reinforced by recruits from the Kofu Mobilization District. The structure of the 109th was different than most divisions in the IJA. After 1936, the normal makeup of a division was a triangular organization, with three infantry regiments to a division. The 109th was considered a square division because it had two infantry brigades with two infantry regiments each. During the build-up prior to the attack of Iwo Jima, General Kuri Bayashi divided the 109th and each was built up to maximum strength along with support elements. The 109th at Iwo Jima consisted of the 145th Infantry Regiment, the 17th Mixed Infantry Regiment, the 26th Tank Regiment, and the 2nd Mixed Brigade. At the start of the Battle of Iwo Jima, Commander Lieutenant General Tadamichi Kurobayashi had roughly 21,000 total men under arms. The IJA had between 13,586 to 17,500 troops. The IJN had between 5,500 to 7,347 troops. Part of the 109th was defending Chichijima, which is about 150 miles north of Iwo Jima. According to historian Kumiko Kakahashi, General Kuri Bayashi may have been deliberately selected for what was known to be a suicide mission. He had expressed the belief that Japan's war against the United States was a no-win situation and needed to be ended by a negotiated peace. In the eyes of the ultranationalists in the general staff and in Tojo's cabinet, this had allegedly caused Kuri Bayashi to be seen as a defeatist. He was granted the honor of a personal audience with Emperor Hirohito on the eve of his departure. On June 19, 1944, General Kuribayashi Bayashi stepped off a plane on Iwo Jima's Chidori airstrip. Meanwhile, the island's garrison was busy digging trenches on the beach. Kuribayashi Bayashi made a careful survey of the island and ordered his men to construct defenses further inland. Deciding not to seriously contest the projected beach landings, Kuribayashi decreed that the defense of Iwo Jima would be fought almost entirely from underground. His men honeycombed the island with more than 11 miles of tunnels, 5,000 caves, and pillboxes. According to his former chief of staff, Kuribayashi often told him, America's productive powers are beyond our imagination. Japan has started a war with a formidable enemy and we must brace ourselves accordingly. Kuri Bayashi recognized that he would not be able to hold Iwo Jima against the overwhelming military forces of the United States. He knew, however, that the loss of Iwo Jima would place all of Japan within range of American strategic bombers. Therefore, he planned a campaign of attrition by which he hoped to delay the bombing of Japanese civilians and force the United States government to reconsider a possible invasion of the Japanese home islands. However, he had issues with many officers, dismissing 18 of them along with his chief of staff. Kuribayashi had also lost control of the naval troops who dug in on the beaches. According to historian James Bradley, Americans have always taken casualties very seriously. When the number of casualties is too high, public opinion will boil up and condemn an operation as a failure, even if we get the upper hand militarily. Kuribayashi had lived in America. He knew our national character. That's why he deliberately chose to fight in a way that would relentlessly drive up the number of casualties. I think he hoped American public opinion would shift toward wanting to bring the war with Japan to a rapid end. Long before the Americans landed, however, Kuribayashi fully expected to die on Iwo Jima. On September 5, 1944, he wrote to his wife, It must be destiny that we as a family must face this. Please accept this and stand tall with the children at your side. I will be with you always. Japanese private Takeo Abe, who survived the battle and spent the remainder of his life repatriating the remains of his comrades, recalled, By the end of 1944, we were forced to spare rations for battle and we foraged around for edible weeds. Suffering from chronic diarrhea, empty stomachs, and lack of water, 
We dug bunkers in the sand under a merciless sun and constructed underground shelters that were steamy with heat. We used salt water, lukewarm from a well on the beach, for cooking, and saved what little rainwater we could for drinking. But one water bottle a day was the most we ever had to drink. On June 25, 1944, Curry Biashi wrote to his family, There is no spring water here, so we must do with rainwater. I long for a glass of cold water, but nothing can be done. The number of flies and the mosquitoes is appalling. There are no newspapers, no radios, and no shops. There are a few local farms, but no shelters suitable for anything other than livestock. Our soldiers pitch tents or crawl into caves. The caves are stuffy and the heat and humidity are intolerable. I, of course, endure similar living conditions. It is a living hell and I have never experienced anything remotely like it in my entire life. Um, hey, hey Bunnett, what is this? Uh, just wait, something cool is gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> I think he's starting to like us. Yeah. <laughs> money, money, money. Doesn't get any better than this, Beavis. <laughs> yep. To prepare his soldiers for an unconventional style of fighting, Kurabayashi composed six courageous battle vows and gave them to his men. We shall defend this island with all our strength to the end. We shall fling ourselves against the enemy tanks, clutching explosives to destroy them. We shall slaughter the enemy, dashing in among them to kill them. Every one of our shots shall be on target and kill the enemy. We shall not die until we have killed ten of the enemy. We shall continue to harass the enemy with guerrilla tactics even if only one of us remains alive. Preparations for Battle Number 1. Use every moment you have, whether during air raids or during battle, to build strong positions that enable you to smash the enemy at a ratio of 10 to 1. Number 2. Build fortifications that enable you to shoot and attack in any direction without pausing even if your comrades should fall. Number 3. Be resolute and make rapid preparations to store food and water in your position so that your supplies will last even through intense barrages. Fighting Defensively Number 1. Destroy the American Devils with heavy fire. Improve your aim and try to hit your target the first time. Number 2. As we practiced, Refrain from reckless charges, but take advantage of the moment when you've smashed the enemy. Watch out for enemy bullets. Number three, when one man dies, a hole opens up in your defense. Exploit man-made structures and natural features for your own protection. Take care with camouflage and cover. Number four, destroy enemy tanks with explosives and several enemy soldiers along with the tank. This is your best chance for meritorious deeds. Number five, do not be alarmed should tanks come towards you with a thunderous rumble. Shoot at them with anti-tank fire and use tanks. Number six, do not be afraid if the enemy penetrates inside your position. Resist stubbornly and shoot them dead. Number seven, control is difficult to exercise if you were sparsely dispersed over a wide area. Always tell the officers in charge when you move forward. Number eight, even if your commanding officer falls, continue defending your position by yourself if necessary. Your most important duty is to perform brave deeds. Number 9. Do not think about eating and drinking, but focus on exterminating the enemy. Be brave, O oh warriors, even if rest and sleep are impossible. Number 10. The strength of each of you is the cause of our victory. Soldiers of the Courage Division, do not crack at the harshness of the battle and try to hasten your death. Number 11. We will finally prevail if you make every effort to kill just one man more. Die after killing 10 men and yours is a glorious death on the battlefield. Number 12. Keep on fighting even if you are wounded in the battle. Do not get taken prisoner. At the end, stab the enemy as he stabs you. Starting on June 15, 1944, the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army Air Forces began naval bombardments and air raids against Iwo Jima, which would become the longest and most intense in the Pacific theater. These would contain a combination of naval artillery shellings and aerial bombings that went on for nine months. On February 17th, the destroyer escort USS Blessman sent underwater demolition team 15 toward Blue Beach for reconnaissance. The Japanese infantry fired on them, killing one American diver. On the evening of February 18th, the Blessman was hit by a bomb from a Japanese aircraft, killing 40 sailors, including 15 members of her UDT. Unaware of Kurobashi's tunnel defense system, many of the Americans assumed the majority of the Japanese garrison were killed by the constant bombing raids. Even so, there were few Japanese casualties because they were so deeply entrenched. 
Major General Harry Schmidt, commander of the Marine Landing Force, requested a 10-day heavy shelling of the island immediately preceding the mid-February amphibious assault. However, Rear Admiral William H. P. Blandy, commander of the amphibious support force, did not believe such a bombardment would allow him time to replenish his ship's ammunition before the landings, so he refused Schmidt's two requests and agreed to a three-day bombardment. This decision left much hard feelings among the Marines. After the war, Lieutenant General Holland M. Hallen Mad Smith, commander of the expeditionary troops, bitterly complained that the lack of naval gunfire had cost Marine lives during the entire Allied island campaign. Each heavy warship was given an area on which to fire that, combined with all the ships, covered the entire island. Each warship fired for approximately six hours before stopping for a certain amount of time. Poor weather on D-3 led to uncertain results for that day's bombardment. On D-2, the time and care that the Japanese had taken in preparing their artillery positions became clear. When heavy cruiser USS Pensacola got within range of shore batteries, the ship was quickly hit six times and suffered 17 crew deaths. Later, 12 small craft attempting to land an underwater demolition team were all struck by Japanese rounds and quickly retired. While aiding these vessels, the destroyer USS Loitza was also hit and suffered seven crew deaths. On D-1, Admiral Blandy's gunners were once again hampered by rain and clouds. General Schmidt summed up his feelings by saying, We only got about 13 hours worth of fire support during the 34 hours of available daylight. The limited bombardment had questionable impact on the enemy due to the Japanese being heavily dug in and fortified. However, many bunkers and caves were destroyed during the bombing, giving it some limited success. The Japanese had been preparing for this battle since March 1944, which gave them a significant head start. On February 19, 1945, the battle began, but quickly came the feeling that the 109th was doomed, as air and naval relief would not be able to help. Kuri Bayashi ordered his troops to inflict maximum damage and casualties on the enemy. The Marines landed the first men on the southern shore of the island. In a radically different approach, American officers and men were first allowed to land unmolested and then shelled and machine gunned from underground bunkers. As night fell, Marine Corps General Holland Smith studied reports aboard the command ship El Dorado. He was especially stunned that the Japanese had never attempted a bonsai charge. He stated, I don't know who he is, but the Japanese general running this show is one smart bastard. About 450 American ships were located off Iwo Jima. The entire battle involved about 60,000 U.S. Marines and several thousand U.S. Navy Seabees. According to military historian Shigetoki Hosoki, he was stunned to find the following comments in the Iwo Jima report, a collection of memoirs by Iwo Jima survivors. The men we saw weighed no more than 30 kilos and did not look human. Nonetheless, these emaciated soldiers who looked like they came from Mars faced the enemy with a force that could not be believed. I sensed a high morale. Even under such circumstances, the underground shelters that the Japanese built proved advantageous for a while. Enemy mortar and bombing could not reach them 10 meters under the ground. It was then that the Americans began to dig holes and poured yellow phosphorus gas into the ground. Their infantry was also burning its way through passages, slowly but surely, at the rate of 10 meters per hour. A telegram has been preserved which says, This is like killing cockroaches. American troops made daily advances to the north. On the evening of March 16th, they reported they had completely occupied the island of Iwo Jima. If you liked what you see, Hit the subscribe button or share. Thank you. This has been Immersus Tech.